Welcome to part three of Computer Objects, Object Oriented Programming Introduction with me. This one is going to be about types of variables and we're even going to have pictures. So let's get right along here. Each programming language has different types of variables. Now these things are dependent on <coughs> The type of CPU, basically its size, its power, and more notably, it's also dependent on the operating system. So unless RAM at is, is at a premium, knowing the actual size of each type is not really important. But let's assume that you're sending a model rocket up and it has a microcomputer that takes a thousand measurements per second and each measurement measures eight things pressure temperature xyz accelerations pitch yaw and roll angles well after 60 seconds you have 500,000 numbers that need to be recorded if each measurement required 128 bits you would need eight megabytes of ram now eight megabytes doesn't sound like much for your desktop computer maybe even your laptop but a lot of those tiny mini processors that are often the size of a penny or the size of a quarter have less than one megabyte of usable RAM so it's an issue. Types and units. NASA famously sent up the Mars Climate Orbiter and it crashed on the surface of Mars because some of the team members were using English units in the variables and some of them were using metric units. That is a potential problem in many, many languages. So, languages were actually created to store units along with each number, for example, F sharp. With Python, variables can include units, but conversion between the units is not automatic. Okay? Just keep that in mind. You can do units, but it's not automatic. So, let's start with the types of constants. The first one and variables. The first type is none. This is used to return an empty variable. None is not the same thing as zero. Zero is an actual number. It's an actual result. If I were to calculate the area of a circle given the radius and you gave me a radius of zero, well then the answer is zero. The sine of zero is zero. Zero is an actual number. It's an actual answer. None is when there is no answer. If you wanted the sign of tramp, well, that's not a thing. So I can't give you an answer. So I give you an answer that's called none. So it's empty. It doesn't exist. Okay? As Don't confuse none with zero. Very, very different. The next type is Boolean. Boolean is a basic type. It's used in every programming language. In Python in particular, we're going to talk only about Python here. This type only has two possible states, true or false. Now, it turns out that internally, true is equal to 1 and false is equal to 0 in Python. So you can actually compare it to 1 and 0, but typically you don't do that. We use comparison operators. Now, equals and not equals are sort of um, different than what you might be used to okay to compare you use equals equals because equals just one of them is used to assign things so if i say x equals five that puts the number five into a variable called x if i put x equals equals five i am asking python to compare x with the value 5 and then it will give me either a true or a false. For not equal we either use the not equal representation of a less than sign followed by a greater than sign meaning it's neither less than or, gra or greater than or an exclamation mark with an equal sign. Exclamation marks as you may or may not know in Boolean terminology is pronounced not. So either way those are the operators and uh, live them 
learn them, love them. Okay, next type of constant and variable are numbers. You can have different types of numbers. First one is integers, and many, many different languages have many, many different byte sizes. In fact, you can have an integer in Python that has 150 digits. I think the actual limit is something like 256 digits, but I can't remember. Um, integer math is fastest and it is exact. Integers take less space than floating point numbers. However, if you divide the integer 5 by the integer 3, the answer is integer 1, which may or may not be what you're looking for. Therefore, we also have this thing called floating point numbers, also called float. Again, many byte sizes for many different resolutions and precisions and so on and so forth. Not important unless you're dealing with those tiny microprocessors. The problem with floating point is, well, there's a lot of problems. One of them is that it's really slow. They take up a lot more space than integers, but the most important downside to float is that it is inexact. The same way that you can't represent one-third in base 10, there are many fractional numbers that you cannot represent in base 2. So if you took 0.1 plus 0.1 plus 0.1, and subtracted 0.3, the answer isn't zero. The answer is something like one times 10 to the minus 17th. You just have to keep that in mind because especially if you're adding up dollars, you add up a whole bunch of pennies and all of those floating point errors will eventually add up and the sum will not be what you expect. Complex numbers, yep, just like in high school, where you called them imaginary numbers, as in 2 plus I3 or 2 plus 3I, I can't remember how they did it in high school. In engineering notation, you use the letter J, not the letter I, because the letter I is used for a lot of other things. So you use the letter J, and that's the letter that Python adopted. Also, you have to put the letter J before the numeral so that it knows it's a complex number it's expecting. So if you put 2 plus J3 in Python, you have just created a complex number. And there you go. It knows. You can also do binary, octal, and hexadecimal notation, which are very, very, very fast. But you normally only use that for really specialized things like reading sensors or... Um, direct memory access, that kind of thing. So really, for the most part, you're going to use integers and float, which makes sense. The next thing I want to talk about in Python in particular, and this does not apply to most object-oriented programming languages, is that Python is dynamically typed. So you don't have to declare that a variable is an integer or will be an integer or will always be an integer or it will be a real or a float or a complex and it will always be a float. In fact, you can create them, change them and destroy them dynamically and the processor will choose the most efficient memory storage. So if you say x equals 5, it will create an integer variable named x. If you say x equals 5.0, it will include, I'm sorry, it will create a float variable named x. Then you can change it. If you said x equals 5, but then later on you said x equals x plus 0 0.25, well, it will assign whatever x is, which we know is 5. We're going to add 0.25. So now that's 5.25, the process, the Python knows that's a real. So it'll stick 5.25 in X and change the type of X to dynamic. Changing the type of a variable is possible, but it's not recommended for most circumstances. There's a time and a place for everything, but the circumstances are rare for that kind of thing. Just know that you don't have to declare a variable. That's the important takeaway. Another basic type is 
text types. You can have characters, which hold exactly one character, or you can have a string, which holds a sequence of characters. Typically, in Linux and in most of the advanced operating systems, you use UTF-8, which allows you to put characters with accent marks and Greek letters and Cyrillic letters and all that kind of thing. In ASCII characters, there's only 127, but with UTF-8, you can have a billion different characters. And that's important because the world is becoming smaller and you need to have the opportunity, the ability to let the user enter a last name that has an accent or something that is written in French or another language. And that's what um, UTF-8 allows you to do. String holds a sequence of characters and that allows you to hold many, many characters, even multi-line text. In Python, a string could be as long as the available RAM. So if you have eight gigabytes of, avail of available RAM, you could theoretically have a variable that's eight um, billion characters long. It can literally be trillions of characters long if the RAM ever got long enough, but the point is I'm not sure you'll ever need that. You could, however, store the entire Bible, for example, the entire text of, a, of the Bible in one variable. Each new line is designated by the special character backslash n. And I'll let you read the slide for more information. Next thing, the next basic type, which really encompasses everything else, are called objects. There are many, many, many types of objects defined in the language, and essentially everything in Python is an object. Now let's remember, an instance is an individual member, such as Tramp is an individual member of the class dog. If you have two instances, in our example here we have two motorcycles, a blue Honda and a red Toyota. We could say my blue bike equals motorcycle Honda blue, my red bike equals motorcycle Toyota red, and boom, we now have two instances, just like if you had two dogs or two motorcycles or two whatever. Don't confuse instances with objects. <coughs> Both of those objects, my blue bike and my red bike, are of the type motorcycle. Variable names typically start with lower case. That's just one of those conventions over the years. Okay, next thing. The list type. In other variables, I'm sorry, in other languages, these things are called arrays, compound variables, matrices, sets, blah, blah, blah. In Python, we call it a list. A list in Python is dynamically sized. It means you can have one member right now. Let's suppose you're doing a shopping list. Well, maybe you have one thing on the shopping list and maybe an hour later you have three things, maybe five things. And maybe you realize, oops, I already have one of those things and you want four things instead of five. That's called dynamically sized. <coughs> However, the instance has to be declared the same way that we declared my blue bike and my red bike in the previous screen. You have to say pipes equals, and then you define it as a list. So in the example here, we're creating a list of the pipe sizes that I have in inventory, and I would say pipes equals square bracket 0.5 comma 0.75 comma 1.0 and so on and so forth. I finish it with the square bracket. Now during this course of our inventory program, we could add, delete, or even change those things, okay? So a list can be changed, it's dynamic, and you can access a particular member. Now, the first member is zero. Just like in the number line, you start with zero. I know you learned in elementary school, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, but really zero is the first number. So pipes sub zero, again with the square brackets, 
in our example would be the 0.5 inch pipe. Just remember, you always start with zero, all right? The next type after list is a similar thing. It's called a tuple. Now a tuple is essentially a list or a set that does not change, sort of like twins or triplets. They're twins or triplets forever. They can't ever be quadruplets once they're born triplets and so on and so forth. Um, that is called an immutable item. It's uh, typically for constants or results that have compound answers, like if you want to give your result and include the units. So if we wanted to create a tuple of a Fibonacci sequence, um, you see it right there on the screen, and to access a particular number, Fibonacci sub zero would be the first item on the list. Fibonacci dot five would be the sixth item on the list, right? Because the first item on the list is zero. So Fibonacci dot five would actually be the sixth item on the list. Just keep that in mind. The next type is called dictionary. A dictionary is used to store an associative array. Now that sounds really funky, but it's really nothing different, nothing you're not used to. It's just like looking up a word in the dictionary. So the word you're looking up, we call that the key. The answer you get from the dictionary is called the value. But the type of this is dictionary. So I have an example here if you had uh, a bunch of knights in your round table and you wanted to store their nickname, you could have Galahad and his nickname is the Pure, and you have Robin and his nickname is the Brave, and yes, this is from the, from the movie. So knights.robin would return the Brave, unless of course he becomes a coward and then you can just change it to knights.robin equals the coward. Just remember the key is the word you're looking up, the value is what the dictionary is going to give you for that word. Okay, last thing. Others. All types are classes, okay? And classes are defined by the language. They're always being, you know, Python is always changing, it's getting better and bigger, so there's new classes being defined all the time. You could define a class yourself. You can define classes that you get in external packages. In genetics, there's this thing called the last universal common ancestor. All life on Earth supposedly inher inherits from this organism from four billion years ago or whatever. It's carbon-based, it breathes, it reproduces, it feeds, it excretes waste. And interestingly, on a side note, Viruses do not excrete, feed, or breathe. So many people say they're not actually alive. Anyway, something to think about. But anyway, similarly, all Python objects have a common ancestor, and it's called object. I know, not very creative, but it is what it is. That was a lot, more, a lot of poop about types, because there's a lot of them. But you have to remember just a few. Boolean and none pretty self-explanatory, integer and float, character and string, list, tuple, and dictionary, and then of course everything else. Technically every one of the types above are objects, but we treat arrays or lists, numbers, and text as something special. So that's why we talked about them separately, and I'm sorry that this ran a few minutes long. For much, much, much more info, you can click on these resources. They're really good resources if you like to read 100 or 200 pages, but it's there. Have a great day.